This is Amateur Logic, episode 155, for April 15th, 2021. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com. And by ICOM, the great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Hi, welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. Tommy Mule. And I'm Mike. And it's great to see everyone tonight. We've got some fun things lined up. It's been a busy week here, and on top of that, we've had a, a friend here in town, haven't we, Tommy? Yeah, we sure have. We met a, a friend, uh, Ray Novak, in 9JA from ICOM America out at the park. Got to play with a new toy. Yeah, you know. A couple of toys, actually. We, um, Ray and I arrived at the park before you did, and we pulled up to the gate there where you, you pay your fee to go in, and there's a sign posted on top of the stop sign that said, Park Closed Due to Flooding. Yeah, I didn't think about that. We, we've had more than our fair share of rain, but I, I wouldn't have thought we had enough to close the park, but yeah. obviously we did. Fortunately, you knew where there was another good park. So we went there. Yeah, we got we got uh, some backups up our sleeve. So but it turned out to be pretty nice. I actually kind of like it a little bit better than the original one we were going to go to. Yeah, yeah, it it did. It worked out good. Uh, and we also, uh, well, we shot some video of a new product there. And then the next evening, Ray came over here and we shot uh, some a little more stuff. You'll have to watch the video when it gets posted. It'll be real soon. We'll let you know where. And we shot an interview with uh, Emmett Hohensey from Radio Waves on a new antenna product that he's got out that's going to be perfect for QRP rigs. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. really quite amazing. Yeah, I'll say. I-, I was really surprised at it. So what have you been up to, Tommy? Anything different? No, same old stuff. I was obviously there, and uh, I did get my Raspberry Pi Pico out and played around with it. Um, that made my segment out of it, actually, so I think it would be kind of interesting. Yeah. Cool. Email. What's going on down there? Well, you guys already mentioned it. We've been having quite the run of uh, severe thunderstorms and weather, and some of our members in the club got to test out their... Uh, uh, and, uh, antenna or, or radio protectors and things that are you know with lightning and and in my case we watch the uh, the flooding down here can we're surrounded by water it's the sportsman's paradise so we uh, that's what's been going on here April showers and lots of uh, uh, severe weather and storm spotter activity going on here so we're, we're keeping an eye out well we're- at least you didn't have to break out the Cajun Navy yet not yet. <laughs> Those guys are awesome, man. Yeah. What's been going on up there, Mike? Well, we went from kind of almost summer-like temperatures to almost down to the freezing mark again, where last few days it's been just hovering above the freezing mark. Um, we've been getting rain, but nothing to the extent that you've been getting down there, just uh, some light showers. Um things have have gotten green here and the trees are just starting to bud up here yeah they've been budding for several weeks now at least you can uh, tell it right here in your bud detectors you know it's sinus sinus time of year here what have you got to share with us tonight on uh, change that's going to affect well 
it's going to affect amateur radio some. Yeah, I have a post. Um, one of our members in the Facebook forum, uh, Titus Carnathan, I hope I said that right, uh, AB3WX, and he he wrote us and um, basically pointed out the update to radio frequency exposure rules here in the States, and that goes in on May 3rd. It's effective. And there's a few parts of this um change where you basically we're, we're going to have two years the first part is we have two years to either figure out are we exempt from having to do this or is your station required to do this and there's there's some guidance the the picture you're showing right now george is the awrl's guidance on whether or not you're exempt or whether or not you have to comply and, and do a periodic survey of your RF exposure in your station. So uh, the other part is the FCC actually has a 65-page guide specifically for the amateur bands and radio operators with a bunch of standards, standard antenna types and, and what they will do or, or you know exposure standards, I guess you would say. So... Um, that's what I got out of what I've read, but I'm still reading. So I really was going to lean and ask on the professor a little bit here about your thoughts on it, if you have any yet, because it's pretty new and, uh, Titus shared that with us. So what are you thinking there, professor? Well, I'm thinking I'd need to do a little more reading myself. Uh, I did one of these, um, surveys for, well, I guess more than one. A few of these surveys for some radio stations, hmm, probably 30 years ago when they first started having RF exposure rules for broadcasting. And uh, I had to rent some special measurement gear. It looked like maybe you were looking for nuclear radiation or something. I had this wand that had this foam rubber ball on the end of it, and you could sniff around and check the RF with it. Uh, at least one of those that was not cheap and we also had the rules like on amateur radio if you're running this amount of power you got to be this distance away but i i read something in this that that you're referring to there emil that said the rules themselves have not actually changed it's just whether or not you need to do an evaluation so and yeah. and you got two years to determine if you need to do an evaluation. Honestly, you know you maybe should have done an evaluation anyway, but you've been able to skirt it. Well, they're not going to let us do that anymore. Right. Uh, that was one of the mentions, in fact, from the AWRL's expert, which they also have offered. You'll see the links when we post this video outside of the live um, feed here. But the. Uh, the, the AWRL posted some contact information on how they can help and how their professionals are, uh, you know, giving guidance, if you will. So you'll see that information. But, yeah, they said the same thing. The underlying rules haven't changed. It's us being exempt from it across the board that has changed. There you go. I like the way you said that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Tommy, you are up first to bat tonight. What are you going to be talking about? Our show yeah, well, like I mentioned, I got my uh, Raspberry Pi Pico out and uh, did a little bit of programming and uh, hooked up a display on it for an upcoming project. As you remember, about a month ago, I got my Raspberry Pi Pico. It's kind of an Arduino replacement. It's a little inexpensive microcontroller. It sells for about four bucks. Pretty powerful. And I've actually got a project in mind for it, so I need to start learning a little bit more about it. We looked at the basics of programming it last time. Today I'm going to set up one of the little OLED displays, the little uh, 128 by 64, a little cheap one. I got this one off of Amazon for like two of them for like eight dollars or something like that. Uh, but it's a nice little display. Uh, they're really handy. I used it on my M5BOC hotspot to display what I was connected to and they're great for other projects. I used a smaller version of that in my 
a voltage monitor that I created with an Arduino to use at field day. Let's connect our Pi Pico to the USB port on the computer. You can see my Blink program is still installed on there that we did on the last segment. First thing we need to do is scan our Pico and see what pins are set up for the I square C bus zero. There are actually two on this device. So let's go ahead. I created this little program. I found some information on it on the internet somewhere. And it's a scan right here. And what it'll do is it'll, it'll go through, it uses the uh, UOS and the machine libraries. It's going to find the name of it. It's going to locate it. And then it's going to print us the information about it. So let's, uh, let's run it. And if we look down here, here it is. It's I square C bus zero. There's the frequency. SCL is pin nine and SCA is pin eight. So that's how we need to wire this up. So if we look right here, we've got VCC for the voltage, ground, SCL, and SCA. So be careful when you go to wire things up on this device. The numbers are actually on the bottom of the device. So I took a picture of it, and I also looked at the wiring diagram. The wiring diagram from the Raspberry Pi site is a little bit, uh, you've got to pay attention because the numbered pins on the diagram are not the ones that are actually corresponding to the numbers in, in the board itself. So let's go ahead and hook that up. I'm going to turn the power off. The ground is right here, the third pin. We can see on the device, on the uh, the power is going to be the fifth one right here on this side. One, two, three, four, five. And if we look at our thing, SDA is pin eight. That's going to be right here. Let's do SCL first because it's easier to get to. SCL is pin nine. And that's the next one in line, so it won't be covered. And it will go to pin nine of our device, which is this one right here. And SDA will go to this one. And that's going to be pin 8, according to our little scan program right here. This little piece of code that we're looking at is available freely all over the internet, but I will post it in the show notes. So if you want to go grab it, you can go to the wiki and go look for this episode, and it'll be in the show notes for this one. As a matter of fact, the sample program that we're about to create will be in the show notes as well. Okay, so we're finished with that. Let's go ahead and close it. Let's plug our device back up. Our little blink program is there still blinking away. It's going to blink for eternity until the power runs out. So now what we're going to need to do is, is uh, get the library. Every time you plug it up, you probably need to stop it because this program is running. If we click stop, that'll stop the execution of it and allow the connection to the computer. This device is an SSD 1306 type OLED display. I know that when I bought it, I specifically looked for that and I would suggest you do the same. I think they probably mostly are, but I don't know that for sure. So just be careful for that. Now that we've got the, the device wired up, let's scan again and find the address of it. We're not going to use it on this, but this is good information for you to have. Since it's wired up, it should come back and report it. There it is. It's, uh, 60. I believe that's a decimal value. If you ever need to write something that actually references the specific address of that one, that's how you would get it. Okay, let's go ahead and close that. We're going to need a library to reference this device. Tools, Manage Packages, uh, SSD 1306 is what we need. It's the first one. If you look over here, there's a GitHub page which I would suggest you take a look at. And there's some documentation. There's a few little pieces of sample code on here on how to use the library. So let's install it. Okay, so we're done. You can see it's in our list of modules that we've got. Let's go ahead and get started writing the program, import. We need to use that library, SSD1306 from the machine library, we need to import the I square C routines, import time because we're going to use the time library to set a pause shortly. Let's create a variable called I square C, which is going to be 
created from the machine library I square C and we're going to reference uh, bus 0 I to C dot scan this this is what we did earlier when we found the address of it and we're going to use that now so that we don't have to hard code any addresses or things like that and it makes it really easy we need an object called OLED which is going to come from the library that we downloaded 1306 1306 I square C now we need to give it the dimensions so our device is 128 pixels high 64 pixels wide and we need to give it the I square C object that we just generated from our scan function it holds the address and everything and we'll, let's go ahead and clear the screen so we call OLED dot fill with a zero which means turn all the pixels off if you wanted them all white you could put a one there but I'm gonna leave them all dark and let's set up a little text OLED dot text watch oh let's we're going to tell it where to put the text so we need a comma for a zero is going to be the leftmost column if you wanted it farther in you could put the number in up to zero up to 128 so long as, as long as your text will fit and we're going to start it on the top left top row let's do the same thing for the next one we'll start it on the left and we'll do uh, 10 pixels down to start it and let's do here let's just do some more and and we'll do this one maybe I don't know, 35 in and 20 so this is uh, 10 pixels from the top of each letter so they're evenly spaced and this one we'll do far left again and uh, 10 more down so that'll be 30 and let's show the, this, the text we need our main program loop so our program will continue to run and let's do it put a little sleep in there so that it has something to do in that loop we'll just give it one second and let's see if it runs so we click save let's save it to the raspberry pi pico and we'll call this uh altv oled py and it's working you can see the text there so let's have a little fun let's invert it zero sleep again and let's invert it again what this is text on the black background sleep one second and then we'll have white uh, black text on the white background so let's run that and it's working and down here in this portion in your program, this is where you would do your logic to uh, do your uh, I.O. pins. If you have anything else connected to it, you would write your rest of your code for that. But the intent of this segment was to have just the building blocks to, so that I can use these to start on other pieces that I, for the project that I want to make with this. Um, this is a big piece because without the display on it, it would be kind of useless for Anyway, it's really easy to use this thing. I, I'm, it's growing on me. I'm not a big fan of the MicroPython stuff just because I'm not familiar with it, but I am kind of enjoying learning it. Um, so anyway, I got a good project that I'm going to make with it, and we'll have some more steps of this along the way. I hope you found it useful. 73. Being able yeah, to control a display is certainly a good thing from a microcontroller. Yeah, being able to spell the name of your own show is helpful, too. It if is. you notice part of the way through there, I had these reading glasses on when I was putting everything together, and I took them off. Well, I never put it back on. I couldn't see. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I thought it was, it was funny, so I left it in there. I almost redid it, but I decided not to. It, it wasn't the auto-incorrect this time?
No, I was, I was the auto incorrect on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things are neat, man. I've mine are sitting over here. I haven't done anything else with them. I I loaded the C examples and played with them, but I just hadn't had time to get back in and and do anything yeah, else. Yeah, I'm working towards something. I've got a few more pieces I need to put together of it, so I'll, I don't. I'm just kind of taking my time. So in the next few months, I'll have another segment with another part, and then I'll put them all together and make the project out of it. The Radio Amateurs of Canada is having their Get on the Air on World Amateur Radio Day special event this Sunday, April 18th. There's official uh, a Radio Amateur of Canada official stations that are operating across Canada from 0 UTC to 2359 UTC on April 18th. And the RAC official station call signs are, are the ones listed there. I won't name them all, but there's basically uh, one in each province and territory. And uh, contacting one or more of these stations, you will be eligible for a special commemorative uh, certificate noting your participation in um, Radio Amateur Canada's Get on the Air on World Amateur Radio Day event. And all the participants have to do is uh, complete one or more contacts on any band and mode and with the official um, Radio Amateur uh, Canada official stations to earn the certificates. Uh, you won't uh, have to send in any logs. Uh, simply check back on the uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada website when instructed and enter your call sign to download your certificate. So, easy peasy. Cool. Okay, we're going to be back in just a moment. Do you need an HF antenna choice that's compact yet efficient? Then check out the new MFJ 1835 cobweb antenna. It's a five-band, one-half-wave antenna that's perfect for restricted spaces or portable operation. This cobweb antenna design is five one-half-wave open-loop wire antennas in one covering 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters, and it handles up to 300 watts. The sky-gray fiberglass spreaders and nearly invisible wire elements blend in with your surroundings while standing tough against nasty weather. The MFJ1835 is horizontally polarized for less local noise pickup, plus it gives you solid gain over vertical antennas, up to 5 dBi gain for working DX easily, even at QRP power levels. There's no need for ground radials with this antenna, Connect your coax to the SO239 feed point and you'll get low SWR with MFJ's exclusive Spider Match broadband network. The radiation pattern is nearly omnidirectional, so you won't need a rotator. Better yet, it measures only 13 feet diagonally and weighs in at just 8 pounds, which allows you to mount it with lightweight TV antenna hardware to your chimney, balcony, fence post, or most any convenient location. Don't let limited space keep you off the HF bands. Get on the air now with the MFJ 1835 Cobweb Half-Wave 5-Band Antenna. For more information on this and all the other fine MFJ products, visit MFJEnterprises.com today. And thanks, MFJ, for sponsoring Amateur Logic. That is a neat antenna. And there's oh, yeah. one... Right here over my shoulder. You can't see it, but Tommy knows it's there. And Tommy has operated with it on uh, on a lot of field days here for the last several years. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just really curious, well. George. Yeah. Is, there, is there an optimum height for that antenna? Um, you know, I don't know about an optimum height. We've been running it around 20 feet or so, and that's more or less where I tuned it up was to be at 20 feet. Uh, if you were going to, I guess, I don't know how much it would change to raise it higher than that. I don't think it has to be real tall, though. Yeah, it sounds like it, it might be uh, along the same lines as a hex beam. You don't have to put those up very tall either. They're saying uh, 27 to 30 feet-ish is uh, is ideal for those antennas. So uh, perhaps that one's the same. Yeah. It's... it's um, it's not like a hex beam at all, though, as far as the way it actually works, although it certainly looks a lot like one. You know, a lot of us went through what it takes 
to get our licenses and trained up with uh, Skywarn, and we we practice on nets, and we really do things. In fact, one of our one of my net controllers who I check into a net is in the chat room right now, KG five C N Glenn. And uh, we spend a lot of time practicing things. And we also, uh, whether it's weather events or being a service to some agencies or, uh, you know, help just helping people. We, we also interact sometimes with non licensed individuals. And there's some rules from the FCC about, uh, uh, bands that are licensed by rule, which don't require a license, even though it is already licensed. And that's what my segment's about. It's going to be how I interact here, just to give people an idea of what we do with it. So check it out. One of the services in the non-licensed class of bands, radio services, is the MERS, or multi-use radio service. And I found these new ICOM radios, the ICV-10MR, rigs to be very economical and quality choice. So I've picked the multi-use radio service in this scenario for using non-licensed radio services, or as they call it, uh, licensed by rule. The MERS radio service is in the VHF range and is limited to two watts of power. So it's short range, simplex voice and data telemetry services, which you'll see. Eligibility for this is any persons that's authorized under that license, as long as it's not a foreign government or a representative of a foreign government. It's a transmitter that's part 95 certified and operates in accordance with the rules operates legally uh, type accepted MERS equipment. So the equipment has to be MERS certified as well, which the ones I have are. And you'll see here there's five main channels or frequencies all in the VHF 151, 154 megahertz range. Some of them have differing bandwidths. If you remember right in a prior episode that I made, the different designators for transmission types like AM, FM and whether it's data, telemetry or telegraphy or voice te uh, telephony, they have the AM types, they have the FM types and even phase modulated telephony voice and sound broadcasting. So there's, there's quite a bit of allowance here for a, a licensed or non-licensed, licensed by rule band there. You can pretty much use them anywhere in the uh, US here within all the, uh, territories and it again it's restricted to two watts um it does have that rule i believe like gmrs where the um, highest point of any mers antenna can't be 60 feet or 20 feet above ground or above the structure in which it's uh being operated so uh that's a that's a caveat but again i'm using it for a point to point short range just to check up on things uh there are quite a bit of products out there and i found the ones i have or greatest value from the quality standpoint versus cost and just knowing who is trusted out there brand wise. That's a little bit about MERS. Pitch humidity 36%. Wind southeast at eight miles an hour. Here are some observations outside the metro area. So our NWS or National Weather Service service forecast office here for the new orleans baton rouge area is pretty active in training us in the skywarn methods and for anyone who's taken skywarn classes you know they don't really want the standard reports there's criteria for what type of reports they want and they teach you that in these classes so i highly recommend you take it you know they don't want to just know that oh it's raining or it's hail and here's they teach you how to guesstimate they teach you how to identify patterns and they teach you what measurements and things they really want uh up above and beyond the public um which what is what really makes us valuable if we take the time to listen to what they need and uh help that that doesn't mean we don't talk to the public that's exactly what i'm doing and actually involving people, especially somebody who might not be licensed, 
um, in how to relay messages through us uh, to give our, our National Weather Services what they want and also to offer a service. They also have the turn around, don't drown part of this. So what I'm doing is basically twofold. Uh, besides using the radio service, I'm also checking on a local flood prone feature that we have near us since uh, we are in the sportsman's paradise we are surrounded by water here and a lot of the drainage we keep an eye on it pretty close there are places where you really don't want to drive through um, when it's uh, really coming down really flooding or a bad weather situation so the turnaround don't drown is something we pay attention to and actually have used this service for here locally in my neighborhood it's all about being an offering that services and paying attention to what's happening around you. Hey, take this radio down to the bridge and check the water level. Will do. Hey, are you down at the bridge yet? All right, KG5 CEN from Kilo Echo 5, Quebec, Kilo Romeo. KG5 CEN, go ahead. All right, I just sent my wife down to the uh, check the roadway conditions down at the uh, over uh, bridge overpass down at the uh, house here, and uh, she's gonna let me know what the conditions are. Over. Roger, Roger. Yeah, let me know if that uh, water's coming up over the road. All right, just heard just heard back and she says the uh, water's moving, but it's not up over the road yet, and uh, we're gonna watch the levels. QSL. QSL, KG5 CEM. All right, KG5 QKR. Roger, this is KG5 CEM. We're looking for reports of severe weather. We want reports only for winds greater than 50 miles per hour. All right, so Kilo Echo 5, Quebec, Kilo Romeo, no reports of any of that at this time from Pearl Acre subdivision at the QTH here. Roger, roger, KG5, CEM. Hey, is this a new radio? Mm-hmm. <coughs> Uh-oh. Another of the licensed free services is the FRS or GMRS, which does require a license, uh, which you can get for around seventy dollars, these use the UHF band as opposed to the uh, MURS service, which uses VHF. And ultimately, the use case here that I'm using is to relay messages from the other non-licensed band through to the licensed band. In our case, our club maintains uh, communications with the uh, local NWS forecast office uh, and storm spotters, who are hams, uh, keep an eye out and. Uh, talk to our neighbors and other people that might have information for us that's uh, within the storm spotter criteria. There is a app here on the came in part of the blink camera system that I use that also has a neighbors app. In the neighbors app I find there's a lot of people whether it's reporting crime in the neighborhood locally as well as uh, storm or weather uh, loose dogs here and things like that so uh, that might be another way we could involve others but I uh, focused on the radio services this time hey is this a new radio mm -hmm. <coughs> uh oh
busted, huh? <laughs> busted. <laughs> I tried to involve her, but then she figured it out eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She she recognized the difference between your radio. So I guess the orange one didn't look much like that one. No. Yeah. <laughs> and I think she knows that brand name too. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of questions. Well, actually, one question twice in here. Uh, Ron W eight WCR wanted to know how does MERS MURS compare with FRS? Well, yeah. So the differences are MERS is uh, VHF, right? One hundred and fifty meg, and there's some different bandwidths. Some of the channels are twelve dot five k, and some are twenty. Uh, it's settable on some of the radios too. So uh, I would say, with that in mind. It's similar if you're comparing it to FRS, right? But if once you hit GMRS and your license and you have that license, you can go up to 50 watts. There's yeah. a huge difference, obviously, for that. And and GMRS and the FRS is UHF at 450 megs or 60. So, you know, that's that's some of the differences there. And uh, these are great for point to point, car to car. If you're on going on vacations, and you know, again, the way you see the way we use them, non-licensed to license but yeah. uh so that's some of the differences okay cool so definitely better than a frs radio i mean it's i guess i would consider it a different use because i do have uses for the uh uhf ones that are maybe different uh i guess um you know, a lot of the GMRS rigs or radios now are even people are putting repeaters up for them. Yeah. And you cannot you can't do that with MERS. It's not allowed. Yeah. So there's some different uses for the GMRS, which is becoming pretty mainstream. Um, the last couple of vacations I've gone on, I've heard multiple repeaters for GMRS now. <laughs> so what about what about those radios? Is that better than um, than you ones you'd find? Oh, I don't know, coming from so, China. So, so I've been waiting for quite a while with these rigs. Um, there's ones from Motorola, which were nowhere near uh, cheap old man compliant. Um, and then there's um, some brands I've just never heard of, and then some of the Chinese radios, which I didn't want to buy based on what I learned. In the ham side. So ICOM came out with this, I believe it was the end of last year. And they are really, just like all, all ICOM stuff, is really solid, well built. And I, I did put it on my SDR, and I can't, you know, there's not harmonics everywhere and what have you. So very good quality radio um, for MERS. So it made me spring and uh, get off the cheapo wallet and uh, <laughs> go for it. But they weren't real expensive either, were they? No. They weren't. They weren't at all. And it was it's in between the Motorola's and the ones that I just don't want to buy. <laughs> yeah. So good stuff. Cool. Well, I've got uh, it's actually an email here I wanted to share with y'all. Somebody may be able to help out on this. You know, people send me questions from time to time in email. Sometimes I can answer them. Um uh, Sometimes I can't. This is one that I cannot answer right here. Comes from Bill Bice, and he says, Hi, George, I'm trying to identify a part found in a box from an ex-Collins Radio employee. It's glass, about two inches long. It has two lines of handwriting on it. It's 50200, then... 55C NC. It looks like a thermal switch of some kind, and I was wondering if you could uh, have run across it in an old Collins transmitter. With your background, I'm wondering if you're running uh, across anything similar. Well, Bill, no, I can't say I've ever seen anything that looks just like this. Any of you guys got an idea of what that might be? I'm with you. It's probably a thermal cutout device of some kind, and it's likely a resettable type, too, um, instead of it being a one-shot. But uh, I've never seen anything quite like that. 
It, it kind of reminds me of the blinker bulbs from the old Christmas tree lights. <laughs> well, it actually does, doesn't it? A little bit, yeah. Our best guess, uh, Bill's and mine both, was some kind of uh, thermal switch, but we uh, we really don't know. Andy in the chat room says, AA0WX, Andy says it's a thermal fuse resets on cooldown. Ah, okay, it Andy. Looks, looks plausible to me. Yep. Sounds very reasonable. So uh, I've just never seen one. And, and Jocelyn says it's an old flux capacitor. <laughs> no. Well, that, that works for me, too. <laughs> you know. If it had the arcs coming from three different angles, I would think so. But oh yeah, you gotta have that. That's yeah, right. <laughs> they swap those out for Mister Fusion nowadays, anyway. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's uh, well, that's good to know, Andy. I knew somebody here would know the answer to that. I didn't think it'd be any of those guys or me, but uh, thanks thanks for coming through there, Andy. We only, we only play amateur logic hosts on TV. We're not the real thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike, you've got uh, oh, some more photos of that tower failure that we showed last month. I, I do, and, and this gives a little bit more insight. Um, there was another crew that was out this past weekend, and uh, they managed to... Uh, to, uh, to safely dismantle the upper sections of the tower that had tilted over. And, and uh, it's, it wasn't designed to be a tilt-over tower. But, no. <laughs> um, anyway, have a look. <laughs> Back in March 2021, there was a windstorm which folded a 100-foot tower in half. A disheartened VE3 EXT arrived on the scene. The 2 and 6-meter antennas had smashed into a small observatory building. The observatory appears to have saved the fallen tower sections by taking the brunt of the fall. Neither the 2-meter nor 6-meter antenna could be salvaged and had to be replaced. After receiving a $1,100 quote to have a crane on site to lower the fallen top tower sections to the ground, in typical ham fashion, it was decided on a much cheaper solution. Sean, VA3SGM the points of failure at the 50-foot level were found to be severe corrosion leading to failure at the base of the section. Note, drain hole in center of flange. The failed section of tower was secured and the top section of the tower was safely removed. The remains of the damaged observatory was removed, allowing the top tower sections to safely pivot to ground level against the bottom tower sections. There was just one foot clearance to the ground. Sean. VA3SGM preparing to lower the remaining sections to the ground. Sean can be seen at the top of the tower, safely securing the top sections to the remaining bottom sections so that they can be taken apart. Penetrating oil was used on the 16-year-old bolts securing the flanges so that they could be unbolted. A new 6-meter antenna has been installed at the top 50-foot level and VE3SMR is back on the air. 50-foot tower for sale. Special thanks to Sean, VA3SGM, Jerry VE3EXT, Dennis, VE3DDP, and Adam, VE3TGQ. Dennis on the left, Jerry is seated. Cousin Jerry insists that this was the first time he sat down all day. Yeah, that was an interesting, uh, that close-up picture where you see the flange itself and, and where it broke off. You can see there's quite a bit of corrosion. Obviously, it rotted from the inside out, um, so it wasn't visible from the outside. Um, but there was a drain hole in the center of the flange, um, but it looks like uh, dirt and debris collected at the base along that uh, flange, and maybe it collected and, and held moisture, and that's where the, the rot came about from. That little observatory shed, um, if it weren't for that top section the uh, top 50 foot section of the tower hitting that um, you know those those other top sections would have would have been damaged beyond repair and they would have been scrapped but it took out the shed instead so that was an observatory huh? I didn't know what that strange shaped building was yeah it was a little uh, amateur observatory um, apparently the ham site 
uh, that the uh, that the tower is located on its property is into uh, astronomy, and you can see there's there was a larger one to the left of it, and I don't think that smaller one got used anymore anyway. It was just there, but uh, it saved the tower anyway. But uh, they couldn't save the uh, the antennas; they had to be replaced. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Wow. Well, always a bad thing when a tower falls, and you don't know what's going on inside those legs either. There have, no, and yeah. and and uh, there was uh, some questions regarding. Oh, you must have had an ice storm or something, and there was no ice, just uh, high winds, and uh, that tower leg let go, and 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 the other two just weren't enough to uh, to to you know to to support the tower. Well, so but, down it went. Better it fall that way than when somebody was up there doing some work. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and that's one of the dangers about uh, uh, towers and climbing towers is because you never know from the outside what the actual uh, state of the tower is structurally. Um, so you have to be pretty careful. Um, obviously, um, I don't know if you could, you know, to put a borescope go up bore sco scope up that far up a tower leg um now cousin jerry says he every every fall he goes out there and blows the bottom drain holes out to make sure they're clear of uh you know spider webs and so forth but uh this happened at the midsection at the 50 foot level so um there's not much you can do when they're when the sections are bolted together yeah well wow. so Y'all with towers or doing tower work, be be extremely careful and uh, you know do what you can to to make sure that there's not some unseen danger on your tower. Safety first. Yep. Yeah. Oh. I imagine there's. A, I don't have a tower, unfortunately. I'd like to, but I imagine there's some uh, probably some kind of routine inspections that probably should be done on those things at least yearly. I would think. I don't know how you... Yeah, I'm not sure what they would be. Um, is there anything at your tower sites, George? Um, of, of course, yours are all guide towers anyway, but um, uh, so there's an added safety measure there. This was a self-supporting 100-foot tower, so a little bit more risk there. But uh, is there any anything like that that you have to um, go through an inspection every so often? Uh, they do inspect them every so often. It really depends on the owner, I guess, as to how often that happens. But, you know, a failure like that where it's inside a tubular leg, you, you really can't, there's no good way to inspect that. I don't know how you would, you know, look for something like that. Another thing that can happen on a tubular leg tower, if the weep holes at the bottom plug up uh, and it gets water in there and then you get a freeze come and it creates ice, and then that ice expands. It will crack that leg. Right. And there's been a lot of tower failures because of that. But, yeah, I'll agree with you. This one plainly just, just looked like it rusted out inside of there or corroded or something, you know. Uh, but I, I don't know of a way you would check for that. Of course, I'm not a tower expert. I I let other people do the tower work and that kind of stuff. I, I'd stay don't you on play the one on TV? <laughs> no, that wasn't yeah. me. That wasn't me. <laughs> the only other thing I'd be curious about is the uh, the sections that were removed, uh, what they look like on the inside, if they're showing the same si same signs of uh, corrosion or not. It, or maybe it, that was just a, a, a bad piece of steel. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Because what they had laid out there looked good on the outside. So you, you just don't know. Wow. Tommy, you said you needed a tower? There's a 50-footer for sale. Yeah, that's a pretty nice little ride up there to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be back in just a moment. First, this message from ICOM. The great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Stay connected while off the grid. The IC705 is a perfect transceiver for hams who want to enjoy both the great indoors 
and outdoors. It's the perfect QRP companion. This transceiver has features and functions at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and the weight is just under 2 pounds. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall. 5 watts with BP272 battery or 10 watts with 13.8 volts DC input. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the VHF UHF weak signal world. This all mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with real time high speed spectrum scope and waterfall display. Smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels. And it supports dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode. Visually sees the VHF UHF world with ICOM's IC9700. Heard it, worked it, logged it. ICOM's IC7300 is a high performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages to reduce the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. ICOM's IC7300 is a radio that changed the way entry-level HF is designed. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And thanks ICOM for being a sponsor of Amateur Logic. There is a certain telephone service that all of us here subscribe to. I don't know if you call it subscribe. I mean, all of us have one and have joined in. It's, it's open to, uh, to just about any amateur out there. What are we going to be looking at tonight? Well, we're going to be looking at the Ham Shack hotline. Um, I know it's been uh, s several, I think it's maybe even... Is it two years or three years? Emil, get off the phone. <laughs> Emil did a segment on it a number of years ago, and um, there's been, uh, well, I don't know if you can see the map behind me, but um, that's the map of North America of all the Hamshack hotline um, phones that are, that are in, in service. And uh, over on my other side, Let's see if I put my finger up the right way here. Um, there's there's quite a few in Western Europe as well, uh, particularly in the UK. And you can see over over my uh, left shoulder, uh, there's a, there's a number in Hawaii as well. And uh, way at the top there, you can see there's one in uh, at least one in in um, Alaska. Yeah, that's one of those are Dennis in the chat room. Mike VE3MIC here. A few years back, Emil KE5QKR introduced us to an exciting new mode of communications exclusively for hams called Hamshack Hotline. For those unfamiliar with Hamshack Hotline, Hamshack Hotline is a free voice over IP telephone system built on asterisk. Typically, phones are established in Hamshacks, EOCs, clubs and club members, ARIES, and other ham-related areas and functions. In addition to point-to-point -point or direct calls to a single extension, Hamshack Hotline supports three-way calling and conference printing where approximately 20 or more callers can participate in a call. Other features include caller display, voicemail, and more. All that's required is an internet, ethernet connection, and a supported voice over IP telephone set, such as the popular Cisco SPA500 series. In addition to the primary Hamshack hotline servers, there's also an experimental server commonly referred to as HHX. What makes this server different from the others is that you can use a soft phone client on your computer or mobile device and have the same features as you would with a dedicated voice over IP phone. Today I want to talk about a ham shack hotline feature that many hams have been using to show another fellow hams extension status. That feature is called Busy Lamp Field or BLF. In order to show the BLF, one needs to have an attendant hardware add-on commonly referred to as a sidecar. Many hams have been attaining these sidecars from online resellers and using them not only so that they can see if their friend is online but also for one button speed dialing. 
Well, the popularity of sidecars and their use has created a problem. BLF uses a fair amount of system resources and has been using so many CPU cycles on the Hamshack hotline system that the system administrators have been forced to discontinue supporting the BLF feature. As a workaround, Jesse WH6AV, one of the Hamshack hotline system administrators, created an online real-time status update webpage that provides the same information and more that the BLF feature provides. In doing this, any Hamshack hotline user can now see the current Hamshack hotline status using just their web browser and it solves the BLF high CPU demand. To use this, all you need is a web browser connected to the internet. There's, you don't even have to have a Hamshack hotline device. Um, so the uh, first page I want to show you is the main page which shows all the calls that are currently in progress. Um, there's a list here and HHEOS uh, represents the, uh, the main Hamshack hotline US server. Um, here's the HHX or the experimental server uh, that I mentioned previously and that's primarily used by users for that want to use a soft phone or a software client as opposed to a regular phone. Um, I'm just going to pick a line here on my Hamshack hotline phone and I'm going to dial up one of the um, audio uh, links. And then you should see my call sign appear shortly on the list. Uh, there I am, B3MIC. And if you click on my call sign, it will actually open up the QRZ page and you can, you can read about my information. Um, there's also a link up here. These are all the same. So for all the conference bridges, RF links, and audio dashboard activities, uh, you just click on that and that will take you to this page here. Um, and you can see that I'm connected uh, to extension 7006. Um, also to note here, uh, there's a couple of RF calls that are currently in session or active. And um, this is what's used for our amateur logic sound check net. Uh, when users call in on the Hamshack hotline, they actually connect to uh, Jeff KJTK's uh, DVMIS uh, conference bridge, which is connected to Hamshack hotline. And um, on Tuesday nights, you'll you'll probably see several users connected to there to that. Um, up here we have the uh, conference bridges that are currently in session. And just to note on the lower right hand corner here, uh, you can ask for assistance by uh, chatting. Um, and there are several um, uh, canned uh, frequently asked questions uh, and the answers uh, to those questions just by clicking on those links here. Um, so that's basically it. It's uh, pretty cool. And uh, like I said, you don't need a phone. Um, you can just use your web browser and uh, see the activity at any time. Um, so thanks to Jesse WH6AV uh, for putting this together. Some of the Hamshack hotline users from the Southern Ontario Digital Association started using 7-inch tablets behind their Hamshack hotline phones. I printed several of these tablet stands on my 3D printer. You can find the links to the STL files in the show notes. Extensions stuff to the Hamshack hotline people are doing are pretty amazing. I, I, I wasn't aware of that, uh, they were doing that. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that I've kind of missed out on. I need to look yep. at some more. There's a lot of features that aren't even on their documentation on their site. And um, more or less, um, I, I've just tried it. Like I've added my Hamshack hotline or my HHX extension onto my uh, standard phone, which is hooked up to the normal HHUS. And uh, there's something called no answer transfer. And after so many rings on my main extension, it'll roll over and dial me up on the other one, which I can have uh, a smart client on my other HHX number uh, running on my phone and then it'll ring on that phone. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with Hamjack Hotline. So you have you got you got three numbers? No, I just have two. Just um, two, like me. Yeah. I, I need to look at putting that on my other phone, on my hard phone here. 
Um, I I found a I didn't mention it, but I found a nice um, a nice um, uh, um, SIP client for Windows. Um, so instead of having to run it off of a of a of a, of a phone device or a mobile device, you can run it on your uh, Windows 10 laptop. It's called oh. MicroSIP. It's very lightweight and uh, doesn't bog your system down at all. So. Oh, cool. That might make a cool segment sometime. Do you have an email to share with us tonight? I do have one. Uh, this isn't a ham, uh, an amateur logic. It's actually a ham college. And since we're both on there, so I think it's kind of appropriate. But it comes from uh, Bill, KC9TPR. It says, uh, thank you, Professor and Dean. Well, at 1700 Sunday on the 11th of April, I passed the extra test. Thank you, the crew, Mr. Heil, and, of course, God. Nashua, I guess I'm pronouncing that, Area Radio Club, Gordo, and Gordo. So I pray we can all meet at Huntsville. And have, he has his room booked. Uh, now he has to make that first radio contact. I guess this was the hard way, uh, KC9 TPR Bill. So that's great to hear of another Ham College graduate. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, congrats on that. And, uh, yep, so uh, get on get on the air. So. Anyway, so I'm glad to hear about the graduates. If you gra- if you're a Ham College graduate, let us know. So mm-hmm. I'm We're- turning into a perpetual student. <laughs> well, perpetual or professional? Perpetual. Oh. <laughs> One thing I did want to mention, and that is, we have added uh, a new series of short shows here. You know, we only have been doing two shows a month: one Amateur Logic and one Ham College. And so we've added uh, shows in between on the weeks that we don't have Amateur Logic or Ham College. We've added a new Amateur Logic Shorts. It's a series of short videos every week that we don't have a regular show. So that ends up being about every other week. The most recent one is um, my experiment on some things I'd seen before on repressurizing an aerosol can that had lost its pressure. All I can tell you is it worked. Now, Yeah, I, I had no idea you could do that. Yeah, I didn't oh. either and I, until I uh, saw someone else had done it, and I said, well, I've got to try that. And I had a can that was had used very little out of it, contact cleaner. Uh-huh. Uh, and it went flat. I mean, there was it wouldn't spray anymore, but you could shake it and, and hear it. So... It's only available on the Amateur Logic YouTube channel. So search for the Amateur Logic TV YouTube channel and go check those out. Uh, Mike has done one recently. Email has done one. Uh, I think we'll have Dean Martin on one here before long. Yeah. And so, you know, just little short videos just to kind of fill you in in between episodes. Yeah, so a lot, like you said, they're only on the YouTube channel. So go find us on YouTube, search for Amateur Logic TV, and be sure to subscribe so you won't miss those. They'll come out every, pretty much every other week. If you subscribe, that way you'll be sure to be notified. You can hit the little bell in the corner, and it'll, it'll actually let you know when there's a new video. Yeah. Didn't you get some kind of cheap award, too, there, George? I put two dollar signs in a destructive interference pattern. Yeah, that canceled themselves out, so it was no money by the time we were finished. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mike and I saw that graphic you did, and neither one of us—that's not the first thing that came to our mind yeah. when we saw it. But <laughs> okay, uh, you know, that's true. <laughs> I'll just I'll just leave that right there. But anyway, <laughs> I want to thank the Academy for the uh, cheapness award. There, it's an honor. You know, it's. It's, uh, well, I won't consider myself a graduate, but, you know, I can go on the wall of shame with everyone else now. (laughs) That was certainly cheap. Good job, Professor. So, suppose, Tommy, like this shirt I've got here, just isn't cutting it. You know, it's, uh, it's a little too bright. Now, it's not pink, it's peach, so I don't want to make a mistake there, but still, it's kind of washed out here. What if I needed something to wear out 
say to a ham fest where I wasn't casting a glare in everyone's eye when I walked by. Sure, this is great for directing traffic, but yeah, what about for? Traffic. But sometimes you need to step it up a notch. Yeah, yeah. I, I can hook you up. You can go to shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic and get ball caps like the one Emil's got and Mike. That's a popular item. We've got cups, t shirts, hoodies, backpacks, all kinds of swag on there. So go check it out. We've got amateur logic and ham college swag on there, as a matter of fact. So bound to find something that you like. Cool. And, you know, we do a net every Tuesday night. We rotate net controls, and, yeah, that's where that came from, isn't it, Emil? <laughs> it's yeah. the longest-lasting one in the household. Dogs haven't eaten it yet. <laughs> I didn't put the gravy on that one before I sent it out. <laughs> oh, that's it. I knew it. So every week we do a net, and we rotate net controls, as I was saying, and it just came up on net number 52. So to the full deck. It's it's been a year now, and our net controls for this past week's net when we hit fifty two happen to be in the chat room right now. It's Amanda and Jeff, and they did a great job of calling the net. They always do, and, and so do all our other net controls. And we always have a good time every Tuesday night. It's a very well-connected net. We've got Echo Link, All-Star, P25. You can see the list there. There's no sense in me reading all of it down. But uh, a lot of different ways to connect. They're all tied together. And we've had people from all over the world, Australia, Japan, uh, England, Faroe Islands, Argentina, and all over U.S. and Louisiana. It's a lot of fun, so I would encourage you to come check it out for sure. I think you'll have a good time. And during the month in between shows, you can join us at one of our social media networks. We've got uh, Amateur Logic Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. Or you can follow us on the Twitters, and that is where? At Amateur Logic and at Ham College. And you can join in the MeWe group. Say, if you don't like Facebook or, or one of the other methods there, where is that, Mike? That would be at MeWe.com um, slash join slash Amateur Logic TV. And you can even join us on the groups.io web service. Email, where would that be? I think it's at groups.io stroke G stroke Amateur Logic. Okay. And you can get the show notes and links and things to what we talked about in each episode at the Amateur Logic Wiki. That's amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. And with that, I guess we'll go around the horn and see if there's any final thoughts for tonight before we get out of here. Myself, I'm just going to say thank you for being here and look for another episode around the 15th of next month. Look for Ham College and our studies for the amateur extra exam. There are actually graduates out in the field now who have passed their extra tests from the university. So you will want to want to join in there if it's uh, time for you to upgrade. Anyway, appreciate you guys being here, and uh, be sure and come check in check that net out. I think you'll have a lot of fun at it. It, it really is a blast. I, I'm not a big net guy. But that one is, is so much fun. I just can't really tell you enough to go check it out. Okay. Email any final money-saving tips for us tonight well, or anything. It, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, from the general E. Cheap himself. Hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it cheap. <laughs> Keep it cheap. And don't tell your wife. <laughs> it's too late for that. <laughs> Mike? Any final uh, thoughts? Well, uh, the weather is getting nicer, so antenna work is, is probably coming to an end, but I still have to throw my daughter up on the roof to put my disco on up. It's still waiting to be put up. So, <laughs> If you watch the show, be sure and share it with uh, some of your ham friends and, and get the word out. Yeah. If, you're, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, go, go subscribe to it so you won't miss out on those shorts. Uh, we've had two so far, and they've been really interesting and uh Anyway, there are going to be a lot of topics uh, 
various things that you you may or may not see on amateur logic normally, but they're uh, they're very interesting. Seven three, everyone. Have a good month, and don't forget to check out the amateur logic shorts coming out next week. On these were posted on Friday. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. Glad you could be here. And, you know, if you like the show, if you watch on, well, anywhere that you watch, but particularly on YouTube, if you would share it and click the like button on there, there's there's an earthquake or something. An earthquake? There. I think it's somebody's Sounds microphone. Sounds like somebody's scratching the microphone. Oh. Hold on, hold on. Yep, that was me. Okay. I was hitting a, another uh, keyboard. Down. Yep. Okay. So I don't know where I was, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs>